Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Hirzinger, it's a pleasure to give uh, the talk and to talk a little bit about uh, what we have been doing um, at KUKA. I will focus on contributions that um, have been made by colleagues coming out of the DLR. Essentially, uh, this is uh, Matthias Kurze, Günther Schreiber, uh, Michael Tümmel and myself. Here you see a little bit also the PhD thesis uh, topics and um, all of them joined us and uh, I think did a nice contribution. But let's start with the topic towards the mechatronics robot and I would like to focus on the mechatronics design of the robot because integrating electronic into robots that has been sh very well shown here and you have been able to visit the lab and I don't want to talk about our little steps into these directions but um, let's start and go down to Earth into the Atacama Desert in Chile and uh, strangely enough there is a um, cosmology telescope there on Jiro Toko Mountain in 5,190 meters. It's used for high resolution microwave flank studies of cosmic microwave background radiation. And it's one of the highest permanent ground based telescopes in the world. And it's controlled by a KUKA KRC2 controller. <laughs> So let's look at the story. Uh, the telescope was designed by EMEC, Dynamic Structure, a US based company. And the control requirements were quite harsh in the sense that you need a tracking error of two arc per minute, you need a turnaround time of 400 milliseconds, uh, looking at a, a weight of four tons. That's uh, quite a lot and they had big difficulties in finding guys who could, could put that performance in control. And on the other hand, our sales guys have been told everything what moves can be controlled by a KUKA controller. So, <laughs> so you start thinking about these things and uh, you do modeling. I think also uh, Dr. Baas did some uh, modeling here. We did some modeling at the, uh, at the KUKA site uh, to find out what could the plant, plant look like, the, the control plant. And at the end of the day, you just send your best people to Seattle. That's where the telescope has been built. And they hang out for three weeks, do model identification, come up with a control scheme, implement it, and uh, bring it up to the required uh, performance. And uh, the solution was somehow very similar to what you have shown uh, in the uh, elastic, comp uh, elastic control of uh, robot joints, that we have uh, two uh, motors in master-slave configuration, and either way you do the trajectory control or in uh, the opposite direction you do backlash or elasticity control. Uh, you have multiple uh, drives, you have load sided position sensors um, and you have to synthesis and tuning of a suitable controller that gives you this fast tracking. And of course the telescope is working since then and we are very proud of this. But we have been um, prepared for that because at the same time we were uh, working on a project called KRXXL which was a robot that's supposed to be bigger than the KR500 which we had at that time and um, we had configurations in mind where we have three axes that are equipped with two motors in different configurations where we have, have specialized gears um, also in axis one you can see it on the right side uh, and similar control schemes actually already have been uh, taken into account and uh, so we were prepared. At the end of the day we came up with a Titan robot. It's uh, 
a robot that, as I said, two motors uh, running uh, in axis one, one gear. In axis two, two motors run two gears. In axis three, the two motors go on one gear. So in all three combinations. And uh, the KUKA Titan was introduced 2007 with a payload of 1,000 kilogram, uh, at that time holding the world record, with a reach of 3.2 meters, a mass of 4.6 ton, and a repeatability on 0.2 millimeter in the overall range, based on methods which uh, we have been taught and acquired at the DLR. The job we had been done uh, was not clear whether this is an excellent design or not, but at the end, after one year, a competitor showed up with a similar robot, a little bit more weight, that's the game in robotics, uh, but it weighed 10 tons, 10,000 kilograms. And by that time, I felt that we have done a very excellent job and we are on the track with our mechatronic design methods. And, of course, look at the Titan. It's a, it's a big robot and it helps the automation. Uh, it helps in the uh, construction industry to do automation, also in the automotive industry, and it has become a very successful product. I want to talk about challenges in industrial robotics, gives you some insight about our uh, mechatronic design. And that's actually quite important because robot prices have been drastically falling over the years. Uh, the, a good side about that is that in R&D you never uh, get out of the job because you always have to um, Im improve your systems. On the other hand, uh, also an advantage that the robots become less expensive so more robots are used. So it's increasing also the number of the robots. Um, so far, I mean here you see a, a sketch from robots that has been developed 1980 to 2000 and in, this, in the year 2000, the series 2000 robot actually was an excellent mechanically designed robot. And the uh, number of parts has been decreased, the weight has been decreased since ever then and performance has doubled. Now when you look at uh, the torque distribution, what torque load? Now we're looking at axis 3 and the, the, blue, uh, uh, the blue surface basically shows what torque goes to the payload, what torque is denoted to the drives, and what torque is denoted to the structure. You can see that it's a tough job really to improve the thing because uh, coming, going from axis 3 to axis 6, uh, you cannot just make the structure lighter and that's it because it's almost a really optimized system in, in this sense. So the question is, how can you still improve the system? Now, a simple cookbook for you to, to give a clue what, what you have to do. And it's not clear, it's not just one thing you have to do. It has to be, it, there's a couple of things you have to go through. And it's a very interesting, uh, very intriguing, very nice process, but it also takes a lot of time. You have to, Id to identify dominant requirements and system relations. You know, have to go into deep system modeling. You have to expand the utilization of existing components by using detailed models from identification. So you have to go through the process of identifying all your components. You have to evaluate alternative design concepts and it's an important thing, you have to optimize the components uh, with your suppliers to be used in the robotic system. So it's not anymore shopping, getting this gear, getting that motor, putting things together. We have to uh, change the requirements and had to really work hard with our supply chain that they change the technology and the component in such a way that it's optimized for us. And of course, once that is done, you have to use this knowledge, this model knowledge, to improve uh, and to control the system in a better way. Now, what are the steps, the tools, of course? You have to implement typical calculation for non-expert users. Non-expert users means you have R&D engineers who don't have a PhD, are excellent uh, professionals, but still you have to find out you know, what, what are calculations you have to go through 
routinely you have to require I meant uh, you have to set up the definition of the components speed um, joint torque and so on uh, also the tilt moment of uh, of the gears are of importance and you have to have a data handling for the component parameters that um, are basically ranging from R&D uh, to the production of the controller. So you have to track what kind of data is in there. And of course, you can think of the tool chain of CAD, multi-body dynamics, Modelica, uh, Dumola. We have been very fortunate uh, that the, you know, these simulation tools have been invented uh, here at the DLR Institute. And uh, robotics has been always a, a you know, a good example where these tools have been improved. Now, component, um, we have, when you look at KUKA, we have our gearbox test set up where we measure tilt force, but also elasticity of the forces. Don't believe the data sheets. You have to do your own measurements. You also see a slight hysteresis and a slight uh, elasticity. It's not linear, so you have to take advantage of these features or you have to take that into account. Also the same for motors. We have detailed knowledge of the motors, um, of the parameters, and we even can design and work with the motor manufacturers in such a way that we know that once they want to reduce the price of the motors, uh, what we have to do that we can control with that motor or what they have to do to keep with us in the business. And of course, some stuff like uh, field-oriented uh, controlled field weakening and so on is heavily used to improve the performance of the robot and to reduce the energy used, uh, but we'll see that later. Then you do a re reliable evaluation of this concept in the early design phase, that's important. Uh, therefore, you need a flexible simulation environment, component model libraries and calculation services for the concept evaluation and of course the experimental validation of let's say subjoint assemblies. All of this is not let's say new for you at the Institute but we have directly taken it uh, into industry and maintained it in the industrial robotics development uh, to achieve a new system. Control is important um, when you want to do a good job it's always Stable control, robust control is a standard PID controller, but you want to want to, want to have more performance, you need to go to model-based control, state uh, model-based control. But the problem is you need to know your model. And that's, from a usability point of view, not clear because uh, usability means that the user has to put in the weight, the load weight of, the, of what the robot holds in his hand and you get only the high performance out once, once you exactly know these parameters. And uh, of course, changing or closing the inner control loop in the current controller, velocity and uh, position controller in the state space controller, gives you a good damping performance and the expert can see the, uh, you know, one, the left plot is the one with it which is natural frequency and the other one which is the controlled frequency. So job is done and the robot can move very, very fast, uh, but of course uh, you have to trigger control to your plant. Now, doing all this requires time to get the model. That's not done in one year. It took us two, three years to set up the methods. And finally, we came up 2010 with the Quantec series, a robot that is mechatronically designed, not perfect mechanically designed, but mechatronically designed and you can see what you can get out of there. You can reduce the weight, you can decrease the number of parts from 1,000 to 800. That means you have less cost because you have to do less purchasing and so on. Assembly time goes down um, and also the performance. I will tell you more about this. One important thing which is maybe not so of interest in, in research is that once you have your components set up, you want to have it in a structured way that you can replace product families or that you can run from one pro pro component family a whole product line. And we have been able to rip, uh, replace in the Series 2000 and the Comp uh, by just one product line while increasing the span in, uh, in the uh, payload weight from 90 kilograms to 300 kilograms. 
And this is something uh, which helps a lot because coming from 240 to 300 kilogram, you already get a lot of application, which is only done by high payload robots like the 500 kilogram robots uh, that are more expensive. So the, the, uh, actually the users can use intermediate robots and we can run it out of one family. Now, this is the Quantic. It has 12% less weight, which is 160 kilogram less. It has 25% less volume uh, at the same working envelope and it has an extended load range and of course we have done some mechanical improvements as well as have simplified simplified the design of the drivetrain in the hand as you see here on the left side and when you reduce the weight of course you can go faster uh, we have achieved 25 percent increase in speed for certain applications you know uh, that gives higher productivity and the other way around, if you take the same speed, we have uh, up to 30% less energy used. That's why the robot, the Quantic robot, which you see outside, have uh, this green um, tree-like animation on there. And that's the Quantic series. With the standard Quantic, with the console robot that has a longer arm on the axis 2, also on the palletizer, the right palletizer on the right side just came out last week. You see, with the palletizer, we had carbon fiber structure. We have told the people it's nice to have a parallelogram uh, for axis, uh, for the four axes which you need for palletizing. But redoing the calculation on the new design, uh, we took just as another motor, axis five, and then coupling it uh, virtually by control removing all the parallelogram, which means removing the number of parts, reducing production time and uh, optimizing cost. Everything from this comes out of the mechatronic robot design procedure. And that's why we took the Quantic here. And I hope when you enjoy the coffee break, you will have a look at it and see it with different eyes than yesterday after this talk. So uh, that's a product um, that I think gives us enough performance really to grow in the market and that is uh, of outstanding performance. I am not showing you figures for the benchmark with, with other robot manufacturers. And of course it's a product family. It's not only the Quantic series, it's also a new controller, the KRC4, which is PC-based control. A smart pad, I'm not talking about a smart pad, but you can think of uh, putting a vertical screen on it was a big discussion which stopped immediately after the iPad came out. So sometimes you, you're lucky also as, a, as a, a designer and developer. And the nice thing about this control structure is, or this architecture, it takes into account the multi-core technologies 100 megabit Ethernet and safety integrated. It was a huge step for KUKA to really to do these three innovation and put in these three technologies at once. And uh, I'm very thankful to the management, to the uh, top management of KUKA who really backed up this decision to go along this line because you have to take risks and you have to share the risk and you have to know with which people you are working on that problem to really take that risk. The nice thing about this structure is that it's safety integrated. You have safety on all levels. Um, you can take safe variables from 8 kilohertz up to 1 milliseconds and even to a line bus. And it's basically a, not a, only a robot structure, it's also a kind of a mechatronic structure for safe uh, mechatronic systems. And when we go on from this structure, we have safe robot technology in the entertainment business, in the assembly, in the medical robotics, and in the future of the service robotics, even up to the flight simulator, which we have shown, and that will gradually put into these products. Um, just to remember flight simulators, the RoboCoaster robotics, uh, we have done nice missions together. The Mars mission, we flew to Mars 
in 2004 at the Automatica. It was a great project for us, for KUKA. Uh, we somehow paid back by going to Sony Center in Berlin 2005 for the uh, Tag der Raumfahrt, which was also very nice uh, set up and also continuing for RoboCoaster Simulator, which has become a product and going on to flight simulators. I think it will be an exciting future. And also, uh, maybe it's not so known, when you look into the web and you find this RoboCoaster or this enthusiast, uh, then you see some simulations of people who could think of imaginary rights, entertainment rights. And you could get some crazy ideas how a system could look like. And, uh, you know, I don't want to talk a little bit more about, I don't want to talk more about this because these customers are very close and uh, you cannot talk open about it. But if you would ex implement such a system, you would look typically in one of the big amusement parks in the US. And uh, I hope you enjoy the ride. Let's look at the challenges ahead. Um, the control architecture, as I said, is only a first step uh, for industrial robotics, but you can also move based on this control architecture into service robotics, and that's what we are currently doing. The lightweight robot, we have a lot of uh, human robot safety research here uh, at DLR, but also in the whole community, and we know that somehow this, this safety features have to be put into an architecture. And uh, we strongly believe that we have a control architecture that are, is modular enough and that uh, is powerful enough to serve this purpose. And uh, this also applies, of course, for the mobile robots. And furthermore, KUKA has founded a company, KUKA Labs, which is not just a research company, but which is a service robotics product company and uh, is going to develop and produce service robots robots, next generation robots without fence. Now, uh, a, a big issue is when you look at Justin uh, and you want to have those complex systems later on uh, going out to customers, that you are puzzled by the control structure which you have to provide in a safe and reliable way. And the biggest fear for us was that we cannot cope up with this uh, requirements for those complex systems. So we got together and we developed a next generation robot control software based on a fast control kernel with real time capabilities, a runtime environment which allows to orchestrate different modules and pipes. And this environment has to cope complex systems like the Justin. I mean, we are in industry, we're not that far, but uh, still we have a mobile robot and a lightweight robot uh, that has to be controlled, tightly coordinated, and also a humanoid type two-armed robot which we have built 2007 um, and which we use as a benchmark internally at KUKA. And I would like to... Um, show you some examples here, a coordinated dynamic coupled arm platform control. Uh, this is Günther Schreiber. He's interacting with the robot, so the force that are, is applied to the robot is, uh, at the, the robot is compliant, um, Cartesian compliant. You generate a delta x and that delta x is then taken as an input to the platform and the motion platform moves then uh, in the direction where you have pulled the robot. Uh, you see some other features like uh, hooking up. Of course, when you apply a force vector up, the robot will not start to fly, but the robot is then, the, the force pattern is then taken to decouple the robot and the platform motion. And also these uh, are nice features uh, that can be used and uh, nice usability studies can be done to, to improve such systems in the future to not have a programmed system. Same applies for um, the tight coupling of dual arm control. So I'm, I'm, I'm not showing you, this is not big progress, but it shows that the control infrastructure which we have 
taken on is used and can be used now for systems that are complex. And uh, uh, these are, let's say, more trials to, to really sh sharpen our view in the development of this uh, control structure that is modular and should be able to control, at the end of the day, a humanoid robot. One important thing is when you look at the lightweight robot um, that research has a good access to uh, and a fast access to the joints, to the torque moments and so on and being able to come up with their own control scheme and so on. And uh, I'm very uh, grateful that, that together with, I think, uh, Stemmer, Mr. Stemmer from DLR and Günther Schreiber, we found a good solution really to develop this fast research interface that gives you the capability. Here you see Hermann, and uh, I think it's Rainer Bischoff, Hermann Brünings and Rainer Bischoff uh, doing um, master-slave control, and it's not obvious who is the master and the slave, so things are coupled and you can really um, use it in, an, in a nice way. Also, one nice thing is the U-Bot. The U-Bot is something which is an interesting innovation because it, it has been starting up in KUKA as a submarine, which means it has had no official business plan. Uh, it was an idea of uh, one of the top management promoters, Bernd Lippert, and we came up with a system uh, doing the um, coordinated open uh, uh, kind of manipulation, mobile manipulation, manipulator plus platform, and we designed it to be an open platform so that everybody can put his, its hardware on, uh, its, its software on, and also add it with sensors. And we're using it in research, in education, but also in the application development for the factory of the future. And um, it somehow turned out that including the EU, which helped us a lot in taking over this uh, U-Bot in 2009 when we are going through a phase of struggling, economic struggling, uh, this road project uh, could be taken on. And now we have uh, research camps in nice areas like Spain and Italy, where people can go and code and, and do innovation. Uh, you can go to ubotstore.com, uh, uh, that's where all these videos are placed, or you can just uh, go to YouTube and you see these nice applications. And this gives us, gets us back into contact with the researchers, with young, talented people who are interested in software, and we are learning a lot new things about innovation. And I think that is a, a, a very uh, nice way of doing innovation. I would like to summarize. Robot design based on a holistic mechatronic model is the key to develop competitive industrial robots, taking into account the optimization of input to output, which means energy usage to productivity. And you can put and design the system either to be energy optimal or to be high productive, but you, that's a, there's a relation about that. And this is for sure also not only for industrial robots, that's also a matter for the service robotics, but it's not that you don't have this comp harsh competition there. The Mechatronic Design Foundation has been developed at your institute. Service robotics requires new technology architectures for safety, sensitivity and mobility and I think we are on the right way. And software architectures need to be prepared for the control of interactive dynamic robot systems. Um, I think that's, that's an important thing and uh, we have to, to uh, be very careful about that we're not driven away into IT structures that are not real-time capable. And safe robot technology for the collaboration with human-robot collabora collaboration is the biggest challenge in robotics, I believe. And uh, Professor Hilsinger, I promise we keep going on. Thank you very much.